with every passing day hundreds and thousands came to him his home became a mandir with a moving and loving smiling and playful deity yes it was him and only him who turned everyone's tears into streams of bliss as the bud blossomed to reveal a thousand petals it can only be said that the fragrance of the first few years is unique and around this time in in the mid 1946 we'll go back to july of 1946 came another family which was to play a very important role which again as devotees we have to be very grateful to came the family of mr radha krishna shetty and radhamma very famously referred to as the kuppam family and it's the daughter of mr radha krishnan whom swam used to refer to as vijayma the author of the book anyata sharanam nasti they come around this time so they were the first people to start referring to swami as swami they said swami and everybody felt this is the name we are waiting for in 1945 my cousin sister came to puttaparthi for the first time and she came back home and told my mother we had been to puttaparthi and then puttaparthi there is a boy very charming boy very sweet boy he is just like krishna playing like krishna so why don't you go and see him and my mother told my father so let us go but my father never believes in sadhus and seers he always a social worker he said no 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 we are not going say okay but that very same night one boy appeared in my mother's dream and said i am waiting for you all why don't you come i said i don't know who you are then he said people call me satya sai baba he didn't say i am satya sai baba i'm staying in puttaparthi we all of you come then my mother pestered my father come on he has come in person and calling us let us go and enjoy for some time so anyhow he accepted to come and he said we are going to stay one only for three days all right at least he accepted to come so we all started we were staying in a remote village called kuppam in andhra pradesh so to come to bangalore then bangalore to penugonda then penugonda to puttaparthi it is a very hard journey lot of problems lot of difficulties anyhow we started and came to bangalore and we met by train we came to penugonda it was 1 1 o'clock in the night we got down in penugonda in those days no power no tea shop no coffee shop no refreshment no even water was not available in those days so two days we had a very terrible time you know we got down and in those days because of no power the god used to take a small lantern he said perugonda 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 then everybody has to go down that way. so as soon as we go about to go down there was no platform at all then we had to jump from the train to the okay the uh, god came with a small lantern he said amma there is a small room there you come and stay in my room so anyhow we went there stayed in the room so next morning at 5 o'clock we are supposed to go to perugonda bus stop by the horse cart so the cars arrived but when we saw the 
horses. We said they may collapse at any time. They were looking so bad and bad in shape. We put the luggage in one and we sat in one car. As soon as went we far little away, the horse collapsed. Then we don't know what to do. So with greatest difficulty, we have to walk up to the bus stop. As soon as we reach the bus stop, and people asked us, "Where are you going?" We said, "We are going to Patapati." They said, "What do you mean? Who is there in Patapati?" People think that he is he's already a small boy. He is not God at all. Who said he is a God? You people come here and pamper him unnecessarily, spoil him. Come on, go back. We are not going to issue the tickets at all. And with the greatest difficulty, we had to beg him to give the tickets. Okay, we got the ticket. We went. We got down at Bukkapatnam. We thought that is the mandir. At last, we have reached. But they said, no, 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 no. We have to go four kilometers by a bullock cart. Finally, there's one family which comes and says, "Come, come to our house, take buttermilk." Who's that? To the family of the Yadalam, Venkatramanapa. We've spoken about him. The only family in in uh, Bukkapatnam. In fact, they say we felt like we we met Vibhishana in uh, Lanka. <laughs> Among all this hostility, there was this one devotee who was waiting to serve Swami's devotees. So he gets them a bullock cart, and the father is saying, three days we are going back." <laughs> Any of you tell anything else? Then you will listen from me. But Swami comes to this uh, Radha Krishna and he says, ah, "Come, come, take Padma Muskar. With one touch of my feet, all your problems are going to go." And what does Mr. Radha Krishna says? No thanks. <laughs> he says that can wait. Hmm? And Swami gives a hearty laugh and Swami says, "You will touch my feet, and you will also remain my lifetime devotee." Swami says. What was meant to be a, a trip which was not to materialize, materialized. What was meant to be a three-day trip. eventually becomes a 20 day trip and in the 20 days she says that we have never been so inconvenienced but we have never been so blissful too something interesting happened towards the end of 1946 where three people who are already devotees sundaramma nagamma and one more all three ladies who were full time with swami most of the time Sundaramma of course is the daughter of Sheshagiri Rao who is seen in this picture in the corner the first priest of Swami's Patamandiram All of them began to get persistent dreams in which they see themselves singing bhajans serving food to so many people and they didn't understand what is the meaning of this dream and they are getting similar dreams So one day when they all confide to Sheshagiri Rao unable to wait sheshgiri rao goes to swami and says swami tell what is the meaning of this dream and swami says yes the dream has a meaning that's why only i'm giving the dream and the meaning is swami said two years you have run this bhajan mandali now is the time to do one akhanda bhajan continuously you should do bhajan that is why, that is the meaning of the dream you know sheshgiri rao had started a bhajan mandali in bangalore in 1944 itself basically when they are not in puttaparthi they will miss swami So, in order to build that atmosphere wherever they are, they thought, "Let us do bhajans. We can do bhajans here also, right?" And that's why they formed one bhajan mandali, and they would do bhajans in Bangalore. So they said, "Okay, Swami, then we will do one one twenty-four hour bhajan. The first ever akhanda bhajan was conceptualized, and uh, they decided that they will make all plans and get back to Swami. So they planned that." eight families were there all the eight families will come together they need every member for 24 hours you have to sing bhajan right so when everybody is singing bhajan who will do cooking and so nothing so they decided that we will sustain on milk and water it's enough we will fast throughout the entire time we will do the bhajan and we will do it in possibly this person's house because this person has the biggest house among all the eight families all of us will be fitted fitting there and they were making all these plans and these plans were conveyed to swami by sheshgiri rao Swami said, "No, no, no, no. I'll tell you what arrangements to make because we'll make many other arrangements. I will also come." And the moment Swami said he will come, the ears became alert. Oh, Swami, you are coming? No, no, Swami. If you come, then you will bring so many other people. Big thing. It will become. We have to arrange. We have somebody has to cook for Swami. You know, you will go fasting. You can't tell Swami. You also fast, right? So all these things come. When this thing was conveyed to the family, you know, they wrote actually a letter to Swami. telling swami no no this is just a plan we have made like this you just send your blessing swami we will conduct the bhajan you know 
But before that letter could reach Swami, they receive a telegram which says, "Ha, I have started. I am coming." Swami has already started off, you know. And Swami and Sheshagiri Rao land up in Bangalore. They open the door, and who is there? Swami standing and telling, "I came. Yes, I have come." So where is the bhajan? When are we going to do? So Swami, now actually we can't do it in any home, right? Because what we had thought will be a 20-25 people affair is going to become at least 40-45 people. And these were also we have to remember war times, pre-independence times. So rations were not easy to come by. How to get extra rice? How to procure this? Because at the end of Akand Bhajan, we have to do prasadam distribution. All these worries are there. So Swami says, "No, let's go to a hall." And they go to a chowl tree, a kind of a small marriage hall, built by the widow of one certain Arsoji, who was one of the one of the earlier devotees of Swami, and she decided to give this chowl tree for the Akand Bhajan. It was on Magadi Road. which was considered as the outskirts of bangalore and swami has landed up the previous day itself wednesday they decided for that from thursday morning maybe 8:30 9 o'clock till friday morning 8:30 9 o'clock they'll do the bhajan that was the plan and now they had to come up with other plans how to cook food for swami we will do all this and you know even as they were thinking like this they go to the chowl tree to make the arrangements they see so many people have landed up there already with luggage Uh, who are you? No, there is Akhand Bhajan here. No, so we have come from where you came? From Mysore. You came from Mysore, and you? We are from from Hyderabad. You from Madras? How you came here? No, Swami came in a dream and said you come. We are holding Akhand Bhajan here. No, Sundaram Masi was like the mother to Swami. She went to Swami and said, Swami, first of all you came. You know, now you are getting all these people and coming. Now how do you manage, Swami? Swami, don't worry, we'll we'll manage, we'll manage. It'll all be fine. Come, let's first make arrangement. Where's the photo you show me? And Swami sees the photo and Swami says, "No, I am not looking nice in that. We will, I will give one." Swami materializes the photo and says, "You put this photo for the budget." Okay, so there's the Shirdi Sai photo and Swami's photograph. And Swami says, "Okay, let's begin." So to start with, Sheshgir Rao is the priest. He's there. So they start with Pada Puja to Swami. After Pada Puja to Swami, they do worship to Shirdi Baba. Swami materializes 108 golden flowers. I wonder what happened to these 108 golden flowers. I'm just saying this because later when this becomes a video serial and goes online, somebody if they get to know if they have, they can come and we can take photographs and preserve for posterity at least. We assure the devotee that we will not take away the golden flower. We'll just take a photograph. But Swami materializes these golden flowers and Abhishek is done, puja is done, and then the bhajans begin. The same people have to keep singing the bhajans. It's the same, but. But they say that it becomes 80 people now. They had planned for 20. Then they thought maybe 40 we will manage. It's double of that also. 80 people and 80 people is a huge crowd. They are wondering what to do. There is no food to uh, feed everyone. There is no enough sufficient rations. So Sundaramma comes and tells Swami, "You come here." Catches hold of his hand, takes him in. Swami, go tell Akshaya, Akshaya, Akshaya now. Multiply that food. So Swami says, "Okay." Swami goes and touches and says, "Akshayam, Akshayam, Akshayam," and then the prasadam distribution begins. All the eighty are fed. Food remains. All the neighboring everybody is called. They are also fed. That food is still there. Sundarama again goes to Swami and says, "Swami, come here." Now food is going to go waste. You finish this now. You you send them back. <laughs> so Swami makes the food Akshayam, and then Swami dematerializes the food also, and he ensures that nothing goes waste. Because Annam Brahma, and that is how the first Akhand Bhajan actually takes place in Bangalore. This was the family that kept doing Akhand Bhajan till the 70s, after which it has become a global Akhand Bhajan. But as we can see, every little thing that we do as an organizational activity today has its roots in Swami taking it up and propagating it.
We are about to start the first Dashara celebrations. 1946 was the year when Swami celebrated Dashara for the first time because the previous two years Swami was observing Dashara in Mysore. Right? His fascination for lights and flowers as Swami said. Swami would be in Mysore to just witness those lights. He was there in the palace for some time. So all of these devotees, they didn't know that Swami was going to celebrate Dashara. They landed up in uh, Puttaparthi. So when, as I said, you know, Dashara might be two weeks, three weeks away. But Swami said, Dashara is coming, so you wait. <laughs> Birthday is coming, so you wait. So this Balapattabhi and his wife land up two weeks ahead of Dashara. And Swami says, Dashara is coming, this time we'll celebrate here, you wait. He narrates a very sweet incident at that time. One day, I mean, they've all got five, six families together. There was nothing like separate food for Swami or separate food for any one family. Everybody would cook, everybody would eat in that. Swami would come around, take from everybody. Or if there's another devotee who would come and eat in somebody else's kitchen. You know, it used to be like that. And he, Balapattabhi himself was a very, very rich businessman. And he says, I've been to so many ashrams, but I've never seen this kind of brotherhood anywhere. I've never seen this kind of equality anywhere. Because he says that, you know, sitting beside him is a rich person, sitting behind him is a rich person. Sitting ahead of him is a very ordinary person from the village. But all of them sitting together, all of them eating together, all of them worshipping together. Some of us might feel, what's the big fuss about that? But we are talking about different times, right? 1940s in India, in rural India was very, very different. And at that time, for Swami to establish an atmosphere like that was phenomenal. So, his wife was cooking breakfast one day. And Swami's grandfather comes, Kondamaraju. You know, he was still around. Swami was very fond of him. He was a sage-like personality. He was still there. All these people would go to meet Ishwarama and him. So, he comes to Palapattabhi's wife and he says, Amma, will you give me some breakfast? So, she's very happy. She serves some breakfast for him. And from behind, Swami comes, put a, puts an arm around his grandfather and Swami says, Naku, for me? <laughs> and so Balapattabhi's wife is so thrilled. So she serves and she gives Swami and Swami is very happy. So he, she, Swami eats that upma and Swami says, will you make lunch also for me? She's excited. She says, yes, Swami, please come. And then Swami very casually picks up one small vessel which is there, an empty vessel. And as they're seeing, Swami taps it and it gets filled with paisam. And Swami says, when you serve me lunch, you can serve this also. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very small incident, very simple incident. But what a beautiful message it is. We don't know how to worship Swami. We don't know that we can offer whatever we have to Swami. Swami comes and Swami says, offer, give me. You know, in, in the times of Shirdi Baba, he went door to door and he said, Give me, give me, give me. And when he asked, he wanted the person to believe that Swami is asking me because I belong to him. And Swami came and Swami said, Give me, give me lunch, give me breakfast. And Swami made them offer. And Swami made that offering sweet, right? He materialized the sweet. He said, Serve this along with your offering to me. He teaches how to offer, He makes you offer, He sweetens your offering and He offers you the prasadam. Right? Because what does Swami eat? What does Swami eat? So little, you know, even throughout the years, throughout the years, all the devotees who have served Swami, who have served food for Swami would say that Swami would eat so less. Right? When Swami would say, Ni anandame na aharam, your bliss is my food. You know, Swami showed it in so many ways, right? Swami showed it in so many ways. There is nothing else we can offer. Many, many years back when we did a program on radio, we thought, what is the best offering to give Swami? What is the best offering to give Swami? We thought we'll do a satsang on that. And when we brainstormed within us, we thought the only offering that Swami would like from us is to be happy, to lead life happily, to, ha to have bliss, right? Because that is the only thing He eats. And if we cannot feed him that, we are only making him hungry. <laughs>